Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and I'm turning the wrong knob here. This is Gary Kildall, and this is Armatron, our noisy little robot here. We're using Armatron to demonstrate some of the basic uh, things that a robot can do. And even though this is a small toy, it really does demonstrate those things. For example, this robot has a shoulder, which can turn along that axis. It can lift its by its shoulder or come down. It's got an elbow, which it can bend. It has a wrist, which it can move, and it has a hand, which it can open. And it, it can actually do something that humans can't do. It can twist its wrist uh, around that particular joint. Now, Gary, this is a, a small example of a robot. It's certainly not a computer. How do computers and robotics relate? Well, there are a whole lot of devices that, are, that fall in this category of robots, and they go from the simple show robots all the way up to a sophisticated assembly line uh, type of robot. And uh, in a show robot, for example, there's a, there's a human operator that's uh, somehow is communicating with this device, making it roll around, giving brochures and things of that sort. Uh, but as we add more intelligence on board, then that's where the computer comes into play. And the computer then controls all the devices, makes some onboard decisions based on its own intelligence. Well, there's been a science fiction fascination with robots throughout this century, but the fictional robots bear little resemblance to today's real robots. The image of a robot has taken many different forms since the clockwork musicians and dolls of the 18th century. But during the mechanical age of the early 20th century, the robot became a frightening symbol of the future, threatening to transform the world into an over-mechanized, dehumanized society. In heavy industries, the worker was becoming an accessory to the machine, repeating the same task hundreds or thousands of times in precisely the same way. To those not benefiting directly from the new methods, mechanization of work and life called up bleak images of the future. Fritz Lang's Metropolis depicted the year 2000, a world divided between industrial barons and downtrodden workers, slaves to an underground machine city operating day and night. The drive for efficiency leads the city's master to consult an inventor who has devised the ultimate tool, a mechanical replacement for the imperfect human being. This remarkable film may not have been completely accurate in its predictions, but it anticipated a fictional idea of robots that persisted for decades after it, a human-made, human-like mechanism that behaves like its creator. More often than not, the machine tended to destroy its creator as well, prompting writer Isaac Asimov in 1947 to devise the first three laws of robotics. These prescriptions assume either a large degree of intelligence or, interpreted another way, programmed behavior, one of the principal criteria for modern robotic systems. While not usually designed with human characteristics, post-war robots were, from early on, capable of programmed motion. Servo mechanisms or feedback-controlled robots began to appear in the late 1950s. From 1960 on, robots became useful adjuncts to a number of industries, particularly in jobs that were uncomfortable or hazardous to humans, like welding and painting. Repetitive functions as performed by the machine-like humans in Metropolis were being taken over by robots with more human-like capabilities, including sight, touch, and error detection. In some of the latest applications, CAD CAM systems work directly with a robot arm to transfer the design of a part from the video screen to the finished product. Joining us now is Dr. David Nitsen, director of the robotics department at SRI International, and Matt Guerreri, who's an executive with Autobotics here in the Silicon Valley. Gary? David, I guess everybody has a, a, the idea that a robot should go around and wash your dishes and clean your house and so forth, but I have a feeling there's a lot more to robotics than that. Can you give us some idea what's going on in the industry? Well, uh, industry has been using uh, robotics uh, for 15 years already. These are robots that uh, are designed to do dirty jobs in industry. 
and uh, they're doing them. What do you mean by a dirty job? Well, undesired jobs, jobs that are hard, strenuous, uh, dangerous, uh, harmful, and uh, lethal. What is an example of something like a dirty job that would be a lethal job, something you've seen well, going on? Lethal is not yet in, in, in operation. This is, would be in the future. I mean, by that I mean um, jobs in hot environment, nuclear power plants and, and the like. But uh, examples of undesired jobs is uh, handling um, uh, work pieces in heat environment, hot environment. What about and, in uh, assembly language control? Uh, assembly, not control, but doing, doing assembly processes. I know the Japanese have been very heavily involved in that. What's going on in just uh, industrial use of robots? Well, that's the other kind of deadly job, the, the humanizingly dull jobs that are so common in, in a lot of our factories. And, which Americans have demonstrated a, a strong dislike for, and it's the reason why a lot of our production is going offshore. And what's being done now, I think, in industry is that we're addressing those kinds of uh, mundane assembly tasks and taking the dehumanizing jobs and giving them to machines to free up human beings for more creative, more challenging kinds of work. Yeah, but you see, a point, a very important point about assembly is that here the competition is very strong because uh, to do assembly is, assembly is a very complex uh, task, especially if it's done in unstructured environments, mm -hmm. not when, when pieces are, are jigged, if, they're, if it's done like people. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, assembly people on assembly line, people working on assembly line uh, are paid very little. Uh, there are a lot of women that are work in assembly on assembly line and they are underpaid so it's a double slam on one hand it's complex on the other hand you have to compete with very cheap labor and the, and the labor becomes even cheaper when it goes to Mexico or it goes to East Asia so that's where the challenge is on the other hand with the undesired jobs like heat treatment or die casting or forging or arc welding where the cost for, a lay, for, a, uh, for the workers is high and it's a very undesired job and it's very easy to do, that's more cost effective. Mm -hmm. I, I guess uh, one, of the, one of the things, one of the differentiating factors in, in robots that are used, say, industrial uh, in, in applications of that sort, that you can build a very precise robot that, say, would weld within a few uh, millimeters of where it should weld, mm -hmm. or you could use, say, vision processing to figure out where the object is and to manipulate it with very coarse uh, mechanical devices. Yeah, or as David points out, uh, putting the robot into a structured environment, such as uh, an integrated work cell, where the work is presented to the robot in such a way that it doesn't require the extreme accuracy or, or sensory capability that some of the anthropomorphic machines currently require. Uh, uh, Henry Ford revolutionized American industry by bringing the work to the worker on the assembly line. And we see a, a very similar trend as a necessary part of the evolution of robotics in American industry, where we structure the workplace to suit the robot and make the robot easier to integrate into the overall scheme. And that's really applied robotics. It's uh, a different yeah. set of problems than the technologies necessary to anthropomorphize machines. Yeah. which is the basic research being done in robotics now. Mm -hmm. And I would like to make a very important point, I think it's an important point, and that is that uh, people worry, you know, about uh, unemployment and so on. I want to make uh, an observation, which I think is important. The number of uh, blue-collar workers that have been displaced or replaced so far by industrial robots is very, very small. And the projection if we extrapolate from the past for the next five to ten years is also going to have a very small impact on the labor force. Okay. And my point is that I think the main reason for this is the fact that today's robots are not intelligent. They cannot compete effectively with human workers. You know, is that changing, though, I mean, with, with the applications, say, uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, say, knowledge-based systems? Are, are those a factor in, in what's going on? Well, I think, as, as David points out, there's a, there's a whole spectrum of applications from the very simple, which are being handled by the very simple pick-and-place mechanical devices mm -hmm. that, for example, the Japanese would call robots and we don't, 
to the very uh, esoteric applications, which require lots of intelligence, uh, lots of sensory capability. But there's a broad spectrum of applications somewhere in the middle where if you select the application properly, then in fact the machine can be very cost effective and very competitive with a minimal amount of, t of intelligence. Uh, ultimately, we will have to go to intelligent machines and distributed intelligence architectures where the robotic elements in a totally automated factory would be in communication through several levels of computer hierarchy. Matt, you mentioned the Japanese, and the perception is that the Japanese are ahead of us in robotics, and you, you kind of pointed out a fine line in terms of defining mm -hmm. what a robot is. Uh, what is your version of what's going on in terms of research in Japan in this country in robots? I would say that the Japanese are ahead of us in terms of automating their factories. And their way of automating the factories is a very systematic approach of looking at a factory as a, as a unit of production and going in and solving the problem systematically from the bottom end up looking for the easiest applications that they can resolve, learning in the process, and then moving on to the next most difficult applications. And we see that as a very uh, logical way of, of introducing automation into our factories. Uh, on the other hand, um, Americans are way ahead, I think, in terms of some of the technologies associated with the anthropomorphic machine. Certainly vision systems, I think we have a lead over the Japanese and perhaps some of the, some of the other sensory um, areas, but it's becoming a world business, and Fanuc Limited, which is one of the leading manufacturers in Japan, has just uh, signed a joint licensing agreement with General Motors. Uh, GMF is now uh, going to be, if not already, the leading okay. supplier of automation systems. Gentlemen, General I Motors. have to interrupt because we're going to take a short break and then come back and meet two personal robots, Hero from Heathkit and Teachmover from Microbot. That's coming up in just a moment. This is George Oliver, president of George L. Oliver Company, who uh, distributes the Hero One robot here in Northern California. And George, maybe you could uh, get Hero to give us a basic demonstration of what it does. Surely. Hello, I am Hero Hockey's educational robot. I have a brain just like you do, but my brain is a computer. My owner programs my computer for me and I always do as I'm programmed. I can talk like this. I can turn my head. I can move my arm. George, how much weight can that arm hold? It can hold about eight ounces extended and about a pound when it's uh, fully retracted. And what kind of functional use could this arm perform? Oh, well, that arm could do things like pick up uh, items from one assembly line and move them over to another. I can use my grip. I can move my wrist. Does, does Hero have the same normal axes of movement that an industrial robot might have? Yes, uh, Hero has six axes of motion like a class three industrial robot. And I can move about. I think I made an excellent pet. I live in Australia. <laughs> Is he finished? Hello, I yes. am here. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll now, stop him now. Uh, George, before we take his clothes off and see what's inside him, tell me, I see there's a keyboard and, a, and an LED display here. What do you do with that? Yes, this is used for uh, data entry, uh, Stu, and the, the uh, LED display is to tell you where uh, where your information is stored within so the So you can processor. program him through this, this keyboard? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I see you have a kind of breadboard here. What do you use that for? Yes, that can be used by students uh, studying interfacing circuits. Okay, let's take his panels off and uh, see if we can look inside Hero and see uh, what makes him tick, if that's what he does. <laughs> okay. I'll help you with the back yeah. one if you want to get the front one there. Easily. Okay, let's take a look at the front here, George, and uh, what do we have over here? Okay, this is your main circuit board here uh, with your microprocessor and all of the various ICs that, uh, interact with the other boards. Okay, can I spin them around here while sure. we talk? Now, these various boards here are the, 
uh, sensor boards that operate with the various sensors again. This is the main drive control board. Uh, this one is the sonar transmitter and receiver board. And around here we have the uh, uh, sonar board and the main drive board. And around yep. here we have the voice synthesis board and uh, one of the other sensor boards here. Okay, mainly you use Hero as a training robot, as an educational robot, right? Yes, he's designed to be used by the student in the laboratory to study Okay, robotics. well, George, thanks so much, and now we'll go back to Gary. As Stuart joins us on the set, I'd like to introduce uh, Dusty Rhodes and John Hill of Microbotics. Uh, Dusty, you have a device here that looks very interesting. Are you going to show us about that? We sure will. This is our Teach Mover, which is a developmental robot used by industrial engineers to develop work cells in the factory, also for training engineers. Let me show you one of the little tricks and games it can play. This is the block stacking game. And it will find the large block and put it in the middle. The robot has a sensor that can sense how large the device is. And here it says, I have the large block. I'll put it in the middle. Now it knows to go back to the previous location for the smaller block and put it on top. I'll let it go on for just a moment and show what happens if it finds no block. Uh, now oftentimes we go over and put the blocks in different places and try to fool it. But like a worker who's confused by instructions, if it looks for no block without work, it goes and sits down. Uh, during the uh, setup th for this, you had blocks placed around in uh, various positions and it wasn't able to find them. Uh, I assume that's because the sensing mechanism isn't really, uh, doesn't have any vision and so forth. What, uh, what, is that going to be added to this kind of device? That's true. John could talk about adding a, a vision to the work cell or to the robot. Well, if, uh, <clears throat> if the robot had a camera uh, interface to it, such that the camera was look, looking down over the work area, it, uh, the computer could process the image and you know locate the locate the particular block and direct the robot to go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that would be possible. And these instances, then the robot could just automatically grab it. I know that David has uh, worked with vision some. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree with John. Uh, you could uh, improve this by adding not just vision, you can have range and touch sensing, mm -hmm. uh, not just a micro switch like this robot has, uh, more an array of touch sensors. Also, you could add some smarts into it so it knows what it is doing, and if it makes an error, it just, it'll blow the whistle. Mm -hmm. David, where are we in adding smarts to robots? Well, uh, we are struggling. Uh, the pr uh, sensors are being added to robots today, and they are applied gradually into in in, in the industry. In industry, uh, there are other applications of robots that would have to have sensors. These are unstructured environments, such as in the military or agriculture, uh, in uh, um, medical institutions, etc., or ho home use too. Uh, this is an area that is very difficult because robots are too dumb today to, to do this job, which requires a lot of intelligence. Do you see the field of, of personal robots growing as personal computers did, or robotics moving in the direction of computers? I put my bets more on the more application-oriented robots, such as I mentioned. The hobby is okay, but that's not where the big money would be, other than on a toy level. But, but you know, if you take a parallel with, a, I guess, with a microcomputer, popularity of microcomputers mm -hmm. and personal computers, a lot of that was a gra grassroots effort. Um, the, the invention of the Apple, for example, by Steve Wozniak was a technical hobbyist uh, endeavor. And it's kind of exciting to me to see robotics now come through that grassroots evolution. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's wonderful. I think there's a good analogy between computers and, and robots. Just like computers started just for, for commercial and scientific applications, now it's all over our life, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is going to happen with robots. And I, I think it's a great idea that there are a lot of hobbyists that are getting into it because we are, we are, th there's a new generation now that would not be afraid of robots, that would be able to apply it in m the many areas of our life. David, something like this is relatively simple. I mean, it's an arm. It can pick things up and so on. You, right. you talked before about not only replacing blue-collar work with robots, but even white-collar work. How do you do that? Well, you saw what um, uh, Dusty was doing. He was uh, using this uh, teaching uh, uh, box to, to tell the robot what to do. And if this information that he has in his head 
uh, could be transferred into an automatic system, it could be done. Specifically, computer-aided design database includes all the information that is needed to perform a certain job. Now, we can eliminate the trainer that uses the teach pendant to move the robot and tell it what to do by using um, self-teaching and self-calibration that all the information would be uh, transferred to a computer and with the sensors would tell the robot where to find things and calibrate itself and then do the job. Okay, Gary, well, if you and I aren't replaced by robots, we'll be here again next week for another edition of the Computer Chronicles. Focus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Byte, the Small Systems Journal, publishers of a monthly magazine on microcomputer technology and innovative projects in the world of computing. In the Random Access file this week, the TV news stories may all be about Cabbage Patch dolls, but the real hot Christmas gift this year is unquestionably the low-priced home computer. Analysts now say two and a half million computers will be under the Christmas tree this weekend, replacing last year's winner, video games, as the most popular Christmas present. And if industry figures are right, that will mean over a million computers thrown into the closet in just a few weeks, saturating even more the growing supply of used computers. That's leading to a fast-growing new business, computer swap meets and used computer stores. Computer Swap America, based in Palo Alto, will be expanding to five other cities across the country next year, and the Interstate Computer Bank, which used to sell used computers through the mail, has now opened up a storefront operation in Mountain View. Atari and Activision are hoping to pump some new life into the slumping video game business the two largest video game suppliers announced this week a joint venture to distribute new video games via broadcast technology. They'll test out the new system early next year, and they say they hope to expand their service to include non-game software. Well, if Christmas 83 belongs to computers, the new year of 1984 may be called the year of the mouse. Analysts are saying the mouse business may grow to more than $10 million next year, and the consensus of opinion seems to be that the optical mouse will replace the mechanical mouse. One of the leaders in the field is Mouse Systems Corporation of Santa Clara. They expect to more than quadruple their business next year. 1984 will certainly be the year of the semiconductor. Estimates are now the chip industry sales will grow by more than 30% next year. In fact, domestic orders in November hit an all-time high of $1 billion. Indeed, the stock market has turned the chip companies into their favorites this fall after dumping on many other high-tech stocks. As the year ends, let's take a look at the year's big winners and losers. The winners were Intel, selling around 41 after hitting a low of 17 this year. National Semi selling at nearly 16 after plunging to below 7 earlier in the year. Other strong finishers are Tandem and Genentech. On the losing side are Activision selling near $4 after hitting nearly 13 earlier this year and Eagle down below 9 after hitting nearly 25. Other losers were Apple down considerably from its high and Televideo also near its yearly low. If you're into the stock market, don't throw away that computer. Value Line has announced a new monthly software service called Value Screen. For about $500 a year, Value Line will send you a new disk every month, measuring 32 factors for each of some 1,600 common stocks. 
You can program the disks to look for certain key criteria and have the computer recommend transactions. The Osborne company is back, though in a very different form. Osborne's creditors have reportedly agreed to a reorganization under new president and CEO Ronald Brown. Osborne will get out of manufacturing, probably out of the domestic market, and will focus on its new IBM-compatible executive model. Rumors are flying over pending upgrades in the IBM PC Junior. Lukewarm press has reportedly sent IBM back to the drawing boards. High on the list is an upgraded keyboard after many complaints about the chiclet-style Junior keyboard. There's also talk of adapting the Junior to enable it to handle two disk drives. Apple finally made some progress this week in its battle to stop the trade in fake Apple computers. For a while, the problem of the fake apples was thought to be limited to Southeast Asia, but the phony apples have started showing up right here in California. This week, U.S. Customs officials seized about 400 fake apples from computer dealers in San Francisco, Santa Ana, and Cupertino. Criminal charges are pending. We all know and use BASIC at one time or another, but do you know who wrote BASIC? Two Dartmouth professors, John Kemeny and Thomas Kurtz, and they hardly made a penny off one of the most widely used languages. Well, they're going to try again with a new language they call True Basic, a supposedly universal basic that will run on almost all machines. It's due out late next year. And if you're into this kind of thing, you may get excited about knowing that the world's record was broken last week for factoring the largest number. A Cray-1 supercomputer in Albuquerque, New Mexico, factored a 67-digit number in just over 13 hours. The record had been a 50-digit number. There actually is a practical aspect of this, since many computer security systems are based on the supposed impossibility of factoring numbers of that size. Well, we often hear that one of the wonderful things about computers on the job is that they never call in sick. Well, one computer did this week in Sacramento after being shot at by two teenagers. The computer kept attendance records at a Sacramento high school. I guess the kids had cut too many classes. And a robot testified this week at a Casino Control Commission hearing in Atlantic City. A casino there wants to use the robot on the gambling floor to promote its entertainment shows. The robot said it was only one year old. The commission said the law prohibits minors from being on the gambling floor. Well, that's clearly enough from this week's Random Access File. We'll be off next week due to the holidays, but we'll see you again next year, immediately following the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Shafe. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Byte, the Small Systems Journal, publishers of a monthly magazine on microcomputer technology and innovative projects in the world of computing.